That's our welcome announcement time, introduction. And now I want to tell you what we're doing here this morning. You can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to preach now. It's out of order. This is, again, one time only. (laughs) Only this week. Next week we'll be back to norm. Uh, But this morning we're going to swap the singing and the preaching. Normally, the the songs that we sing are preparation for the hearing of God's Word. And then we sing a responsive song at the end. This morning, we sung just a couple of preparatory songs, but we'll be able to respond in song in greater measure after the sermon. And the reason for that is we are closing out Revelation chapter 4 and 5 this morning. Uh, This is likely the the last time we will be together in this throne room scene on the pages of Scripture. Until, of course, we are together there in person. And so I I think there's no better place, if ever there was a passage of Scripture that almost demands that we do the singing after the preaching, it is this section as we close this out. It, It closes in a climax of song that envelops the entire universe. And one of the interesting things about preaching is when I'm preaching, all of the songs that we sing before the sermon are responsive because my heart is already full with what the Word of God is going to say to us as we gather. And, and, and the rest don't benefit. When, when I'm not preaching, I, I don't benefit from knowing what's coming in the Word of God and, and having that impact the way that I sing. Uh, this morning, we, we all get to join in to the response of singing truth to one another in a number of songs in a row to what we hear in God's Word. That is, by the way, how heaven will be. You need to know that your worship is fueled by your theology. It will never rise above what you know to be true about God. And so in one sense, in heaven, we will have the total culmination of all that we can access about the truth of who God is that actually fuels our worship. And as you know, worship is all of life, not just the singing part of a worship service. Preaching is part of the worship service. The one and others are part of the worship service. To my own chagrin, the announcements are even part of the worship service. But worship is to be all of life, and it will never rise above your view of God. What you know to be true about who God is, your theology. Let me give an introduction to this text. Our world is in crisis. You may feel at this moment the threat of world war. You may be keenly aware of the normalization of self-destructive behavior. A rise in crime in the populace and corruption in the government. We face economic uncertainties, natural and man-made disasters. And we are globally connected now in a downward spiral of depravity and insanity. We might add that the church is in crisis. Distracted, temporally minded, worldly. The church is marked by bad doctrine and bad behavior. And when the church longs to resemble the world's problems rather than bring God's solutions to those problems, that is, when the church is committing adultery with her Lord's enemies, the church is in crisis. But there is portrayed in Revelation 4 and 5 a crisis that surpasses all of that. There could be no greater crisis than that this world would go on spinning with humanity in rebellion, with Satan at the helm, the Creator dishonored, all creation under a curse. The curse of disorder, devolution, decomposition, decay, disease, dissatisfaction, and death. If the world kept spinning this way, that would be a crisis of immeasurable proportions. This throne room scene of Revelation 4 and 5 depicts the climax of that crisis. Is there anyone worthy to clean up this mess, to redeem the earth, to fix what is so terminally broken? Is there anyone worthy to break the seals, to open the scroll? And we've seen there is the Lion of Judah. The root of David, the the one who is none other than the slain lamb of Calvary's cross. He is worthy. 
And he steps up in this throne room scene to take the scroll. And as he steps up to take the scroll from the one seated on the throne, an unstoppable chain reaction ensues in heaven. And what began with the four living creatures expanded to the 24 elders and then to an uncountable sea of angels eventually encompasses everything everywhere. And that unstoppable chain reaction is the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why this scene? Why will heaven stop everything and sing when Jesus takes the scroll? Because the only one worthy to take that scroll and to break its seals, to redeem the earth from corruption, is finally doing what he promised. What follows this throne room scene will be the events of Revelation 6 through 19, a series of worldwide judgments from heaven against this rebellious world, culminating in the personal return of the king. The result of the Lamb's taking the scroll is an eruption of song declaring the worthiness of Christ. Taking the scroll is akin to taking the wheel of a car, taking the helm of the earth. Satan will no longer be God of this world. He will no longer be allowed to mind blind its inhabitants. He will no longer be free to roam the world and devour God's people. Look, it was always going to end this way. With Satan defeated, rebellion squashed, and Jesus on the throne. For God's shalom, his peace through superior firepower to come and reign manifestly on the earth. It was always going this way. God is sovereign. Jesus will reign. The rebellion of Satan, the rebellion of humanity, the corruption of the world, all of that is short-lived. And friend, whose side are you on? This scene in Revelation 4 and 5 is still future, but it is inevitable. Heaven sings in this scene because heaven knows it's about to go down. When the Lamb takes the scroll, He might do it next week, He might do it in another thousand years. But soon, when the Lamb takes the scroll, all will sing the worthiness of Christ. And that's what this passage is about. It is about the song that all will sing. And it is all about the worth of Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, everything made is Christ's by right of creation. Therefore, worship from every made thing is also his right. It's his due. John 1, 3, all things came into being through Jesus, and apart from Jesus, nothing came into being that has come into being. John 1, 10, the world was made through him. Colossians 1, 16, by Christ, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. But there's more in this worship service. There is more in the worthiness of Christ than the mere fact that he made everything. In Christ, we see the display of the divine attributes. Listen to Colossians 2. In him, that is in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. This worship service is appropriate to center on Christ because in Christ you see God. And there's still more in the worthiness of Christ. Hebrews 2.10 tells us he is the author of salvation and the one by whose death he brought many sons to glory. And so sinners who have no business being in the awesome radiance of divine glory will be there, having been made alive, having been forgiven, having had all debts canceled at the cross, Colossians 2.13, and having their bodies been transformed by the resurrection, Philippians 3.21. No mere mortal, no sinner can get in the way that we are. But the Lord Jesus Christ has done the work to make us sinners able to be there. To to survive the inferno of God's glory and actually to enjoy it. And so the uncountable gathering of the redeemed will join the choir of heavenly beings to praise Jesus Christ as God as creator, as redeemer. All of these realities find their way into the song that will envelop the whole universe. 
This is the song sung at the end of Revelation 5. In this song, specifically in verses 11 to 14, we'll look at this morning, we, writ- we witness a crescendo. We witness a crescendo in this song in four phases. Notice first in verse 11, a massive assembly of angels. Look down at Revelation 5, 11. Then I looked, says John, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. This massive assembly of angels surrounds the throne. John begins by saying, and I saw. This marks a new scene in the scene. And what began as a quartet, what grew to an ensemble, is now joined by a choir, like a choir none has ever heard. Angels had significant roles at significant events in the life of Christ. They announced his birth in Luke 2. Angels were there at his temptation in Matthew 4. They were there in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22. They were there at the resurrection in Luke 20. They were there to announce and proclaim his ascension in Acts 1 and his return to heaven. They welcomed him according to 1 Timothy 3.16. They have been an audience to his salvation work in believers according to 1 Peter 1. They are servants to those being saved, Hebrews chapter 1. And they will be on the clouds with him at his return, Matthew 25, 31. What's interesting is angels were not said to be present at the cross. We do know that Jesus could have called legions of angels to rescue him from the hands of his oppressors. But he did not. Because he came to lay his life down and to take it up again. And so at the cross, the second person of the Trinity was alone. Abandoned. But the angels show up again here, and they are gathered to join the growing chorus of adoration of the slain lamb. In verse 11, they surround the throne of the four living beings and the 24 elders. And notice the numbers. Myriad is a Greek word for the largest number in their vocabulary. It was the number 10,000. And and here it's pluralized. It's not a a myriad of angels. It's myriads. That's tens of thousands. But it's not just plural. It's also multiplied by plural. It's thousands or ten thousands of ten thousands. It's ten thousands plural times ten thousands plural. If you go with the bare minimum minimum, and you take myriads as meaning two ten thousands or twenty thousand, and you add myriads times myriads plus thousands times thousands, you end up with 404 million angels. That's at the bare minimum. And I don't think that's what John means. This plural means he hasn't counted them. And this is exactly what Daniel 7.10 records, although Daniel has the order just the opposite. He says thousands of thousands, wait for it, ten thousands times ten thousands. Daniel goes from the smaller number to the larger. It's interesting, John goes from the bigger to the smaller. What is he doing here? This has a dramatic effect. Because if you take the biggest number you can think of, make it a plural, multiply it by the biggest number you can think of, also in the plural, and come up with this astronomical number, you think, wow, that's really big. And John says, and we're not done yet. Add to that thousands times thousands. The effect of all of this is this climactic effect The stunning realization that the the biggest numbers cannot convey how many angels are there. The biggest number you can think of times the biggest number you think of. Nope. Not just that many. There are more. Thousands and thousands more. Can you imagine the scene? Nothing disordered. Nothing out of place. Nothing out of sync. Nothing out of tune. Notice secondly, in this crescendo, a unified proclamation of praise. Verse 12, these angels are saying with a loud voice, and I think this picks up on the verb in chapter 5 verse 9 for singing. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Like a giant electromagnet in a room full of paper clips, 
the exalted Christ captivates every eye, conscripts every voice, and compels every creature to acknowledge his worthiness. They are all drawn to the sinner. And they cry out, worthy is the lamb, the one having been slain. And they say he is worthy. Our English word worship is simply the old English word worthship, just shortened. It means to declare the worthiness of something. And here the countless angels join the song of heaven and they declare that Jesus the Christ, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb slain on Calvary's cross, is indeed worthy. And what is he worthy for? He is worthy to receive. And then a list of things are given. Here this word receive does not mean Jesus is getting something he does not have. This means he is being recognized for what is intrinsically his. The angels are declaring what is true about Christ. They are ascribing these qualities as rightful possessions of Christ. And he is worthy to be recognized for them. They are rehearsing theology. They are rehearsing what is true about God. The the truth about God, the theology fuels their worship. And again, our our worship of God will never rise above our theology. Our worship of God can can only comport with what we know to be true about God, what we believe from His own self-disclosure. Our worship of God in life and in gathering and in song will be as rich or as poor as our believed and lived theology is. And think about this scene in Revelation 4 and 5. All that has been true about God as revealed to the heavenly host, as revealed in God's management of history, all of that is known and informs this song. This is not emotionalism. This is not hype for hype's sake. You know how a crowd draws a crowd? Hey, what's everybody looking at? I'll go over there too. This isn't everybody saying the same thing or doing the same thing for some reason of the greatness of the crowd. No, the crowd has been drawn in its attention to the center of attention, to the throne of God, and to the slain lamb. And notice what they proclaim. Power. Power. To Christ, all power. This is strength exercised. It is omnipotence enlisted. All power residing in the hands of one who does not and cannot abuse power. He can't misuse it. His unopposable power is always used for good. And ironic that power is the first ascription made to a lamb. One standing as if slain. It's the picture of weakness and vulnerability and sacrifice and death. And yet he's standing in the victory of his cross work, having accomplished all that he intended. And we know that the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of men. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, what the world despises as shameful and weak and puny and pathetic, the cross of Christ, is actually the emblem of the strength of God. And so ascription to Christ of power. And then look, riches. Riches. That is, all things belong to Jesus, for he made all things. He is a limitless treasury of infinite resources. He is indebted to none, and all are indebted to him. He is the giver of all good things. He is lavish in his generosity, but never reckless with his resources. His treasure is never squandered. And they ascribe to him wisdom. Wisdom in creation. Think about that for just a moment. Think about the things that have been made. The the best physicists in the world don't yet understand physics. There's still things to learn. The best biochemists in the world are still stumped. The, The marine biologists haven't discovered everything yet, much less understood everything. Astronomers, fill in the blanks of all discovery, of all inquiry. And we are only beginning to approach a glimpse at the things God has in his genius created. Think about 
his wisdom in his rule. The exercise of his macro and meticulous sovereignty over every event in the universe, down to the finite details. He knows all contingencies. He does what is best all the time. Consider his wisdom in the exercise of power. Christ's perfect wisdom is always executed in righteousness. And think about this. While the cross of that sacrificial lamb is considered foolishness by the world, we know that it is the supreme wisdom of God. Next, to describe to Jesus might. This is strength possessed. It's a near synonym of that word power we just saw. But this word for might describes strength whether or not it is exercised. It is strength in reserve. It is never maxed out and it is always under control. And then honor. Angels ascribe honor to Christ because he is honorable. He is worthy of every recognition of his pure and noble character. And he is particularly worthy to receive honor as the one who is so dishonorably treated when he came to earth the first time. That is the point of Philippians 2 and Isaiah 53, that that servant who suffered would be high and lifted up, directly related to his suffering service. And they ascribe glory, intrinsic glory. Not the kind of glory that shone on Moses' face because he was in the presence of an intrinsically glorious God, but the kind of glory that emanates and radiates out from the glorious one. All the beings in this scene singing this song are glorious, but they are ascribing glory to him of a different kind. This is divine brilliance radiating out from Christ. It is the blinding brightness of the godness of God. As Jonathan Edwards described it, the glory of God described here is the sum total of all of God's attributes shining forth in perfect brilliance. And then they ascribe to him blessing. This is the intrinsic blessedness of God, which means that he is inviolably happy in himself. In fact, he is so superabounding in his self-sufficient gladness that that blessedness overflows and spills out onto his creatures like a fountain, like God just can't contain his happiness and created creatures to benefit from and enjoy their happiness in him. This is the God who promised at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. God can deliver on that promise because there is more than enough blessedness in God to satisfy his creatures for all of eternity. Listen, what is the definition of eternal life? John 17, 3, that we may know him and the one that he sent. We will never exhaust it. The eternal state in the presence of God will never be and can never be boring. Notice the word and in between each of these ascriptions. Power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Those ands are in the original. The English translation here reflects the rhythm in the original. It is pulsing, it is building. Each word is separated out for individual contemplation. And maybe the ands in between each of the ascriptions give a pregnant pause for the elders in verse 14 to say, Amen. We will find that they keep saying it. Maybe they say it after each of these characteristics of God laid out. There are sermons here for another time. You, you can study these out, write these sermons, uh, proclaim them to your friends. This is your homework. Think about power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing or the gladness of God in these things in his works of creation. Trace out your Bible and see how God responds with all of these things, all of these characteristics on display in his works of creation. You can also find every single one of these attributes on display in God's works of redemption. And we'll bypass those sermons this morning. It's so interesting that these angels who have never sinned, who have never experienced forgiveness, redemption, or salvation, they are praising Christ for his crosswork in this song. 
They're not beneficiaries of his death. And yet the death of Christ reveals something of the glory of God to them. The character of God, the unfathomable purposes of God. And so they worship on the basis that Christ laid down his life to save sinners. The angels. And just take note once again that heaven has not gotten past the good news of the slain lamb of Calvary's cross. And we never will. He will bear the scars. He will, he will bear the marks of having been slaughtered. And he will be the center of attention for all of eternity for these things. His power, his riches, his wisdom, his might, his honor, his glory, and his blessing, they are all worthy of recognition. And so all the angels join the song. Notice thirdly in verse 13, a universal expansion of worship. And every created thing, John reports, which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. With the four living beings, the 24 elders, and the uncountable angels, the song isn't loud enough yet. The choir isn't big enough. Not until... Psalm 69, 34 is fulfilled. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. Or Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so we go from a quartet to an ensemble to a choir to universal symphony. This climatic conclusion of the enthronement scene <laughs> whets our appetite for what is to come. Blessing and honor and glory and dominion. Those are the lyrics. This last word is a new word for strength. Blessing, honor, and glory we've already seen. But dominion here, it's another synonym of strength and might and power. This is active power, active power applied to ruling. This is sovereignty. Dominion's a good word for it. And then this deafening unison that encompasses everything everywhere and everyone everywhere drowns out any com competition. Notice every creature is said here. This emphasizes the fundamental distinction between God the creator and everything else. There will always be an infinite difference between the maker and what has been made. He is the creator Everything else is created, and simply by right of creation, everything that has been created must say these things. This scene even previews the reality that the enemies of God will be compelled to agree that Jesus is Lord. Every knee will bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth and the sea and all that is in it. And that includes every fallen angel and Satan himself, and every unrepentant rebel in the history of mankind, there will be some who sing these words with a great big smile on their face, and there will be some who sing, who must, who are compelled to, through the gnashing of teeth, through the grinding of molars, in unrepentant, compelled obedience. John hears the voices of the enemies joining the choir who are compelled to give God his due. That will lead us into the scene in chapter 6 that unfolds the rest of the book of Revelation. Notice the audience here. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Singular throne belonging to the Father and to the Son. There's something really important for us to see here. There is shared sovereignty, shared honor, shared glory, shared power. We'll come back to this thought. Notice fourthly in this crescendo of praise, a responsive expression of agreement. Look at verse 14. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. These four living beings are giving their approval to what is going on universally. <laughs> Amen just means truth, true that, verified, Check, yes, 
so be it. And they are repeating this amen, perhaps between each ascription of the attributes of God. He is worthy to receive power, amen, riches, amen, wisdom, amen, might and honor and glory and blessing. And then the four attributes in verse 13. And the the elders as a response fell down and worshiped. This inner circle of worship around the throne responds to the universal acclaim sung in deafening unison by everything in the universe. This is glorious. And friends, if Jesus is not God, this is blasphemous. Have you ever wondered, why why is Jesus, the, the babe born in Bethlehem, why is, why is this Messiah the center of attention in the scene of heaven? And, and why is he at the center, at the throne? Uh, why is there one throne and, and two persons? Is this okay? Listen, it, not only is it okay for the Son to be worshipped in heaven, it is actually the Father's express purpose that the Son would be worshipped by heaven. And by everything else, throughout all creation, by every being. This gets down to the heart of our Christology, our study of the person and work of Christ, the second person of the Trinity. This gets down to the very role of the second person. His role in the Godhead is to put on display who God is and what he is like. In Colossians 2.9, we read, In him all the fullness of godness dwells bodily. You think about what Isaiah reported in Isaiah chapter 6. He said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord holy and lifted up. John 12.41 says that Isaiah saw Jesus, beheld his glory. With the one seated on the throne and he saw Jesus. When you think about all the theophanies or, or the appearances of God in Scripture, just pay close attention to what is described. What do you see? What do you see in all of those theophanies? The, the stitch of the end of a robe, smoke filling a temple, fire, rumblings, sounds. Yeah, but what does he look like? What do we know about God fundamentally, in his essence, ontologically? He is non-corporeal. He doesn't have a body, and he is invisible, not seeable. Think about Revelation 20 and verse 11, the great white throne. John says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. And and we might think him who sat upon it consistently in the book of Revelation, that, that must be God the Father. And yet we read this in John 5, 22. The Father doesn't judge anyone, but has given all judgment to the Son. Acts 17, 31. God fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And 2 Timothy 4, 1. Christ Jesus is to judge the living and the dead. The scripture overwhelmingly affirms that it is Jesus who will judge. The one who was judged for our sin will be the one to be the final judge of sin of unredeemed humanity. And think about this statement, 1 Timothy 6.16, no one has seen God, nor can see God. What does that mean? Didn't Jesus himself say in the Sermon on the Mount, the pure in heart shall see God? Which is it? 1 Timothy 1.17, God is invisible. And yet Colossians says the fullness dwells bodily. What do we make of Jesus' statement to Philip? Philip, how long have you been with me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see, the express role of the second person of the Trinity, according to the Bible, is to visibly manifest the invisible God. John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father has explained him. Jesus is called the Word of God, the explanation of God, the depiction of God. And visibly so, Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.19, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. This is familiar. I know it's not Christmas time. This really isn't a Christmas 
poem here in Isaiah 9, 6. I guess we can use it there. But this is the cosmic culmination of all things verse about Christ. Isaiah 9, 6, a child will be born to us, a son will be given, the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name, and then you almost want to just go handle on this, shall be called <laughs> Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Wait, 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 this child's name is Mighty God? Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Okay, I... I think I understand the Trinity. God's the King. Jesus is the Prince. He's the Son. God's the Father. The second person is the Son. But, but here the child is called Eternal Father. Hey, have you ever wondered, did Isaiah get the Trinity wrong? No, absolutely this child should be called Eternal Father. Within the Trinitarian relationships, the second person of the Trinity is the Son, has always been the Son, will always be the Son. He is Son to the Father. And yet in his relationship to everything else, Jesus Christ bears all the attributes of God. And one of the attributes of God is God's fatherhood over all creation. Jesus carries all the divine attributes, including fatherhood over everything. It's right for Isaiah the prophet to say, this child who will be born is not only Prince of Peace, but Eternal Father. His role as second person is to put on display who God is. Hebrews 1, 2. In these last days, God spoke, not in sundry times and diverse manners through holy men of old like he did in the past, but now God has spoken in Son, His Son. He's revealing Himself through His Son. Hebrews 1, 3. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact representation of His nature. Listen, not only is it okay for Jesus to be worshipped by the angels, by the elders, by the four fiery beings, and by everything in the universe, it is expressly God's purpose to order all worship and to bring all history into the worship directed at His Son. For the Son is, according to Romans 9, 5, God over all, blessed forever. This is who He is. These passages certainly declare that Jesus is God, but they say more than that. They declare that the role of the second person of the Trinity is precisely to communicate to us what God is like, even to visibly manifest the personal presence of the invisible God. And the worship of Christ, the exaltation of Christ, according to Philippians 2.9, results after his utter humiliation. Equality with God was not something he had to go grasp And he willingly emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave in the likeness of men, humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus will be worshiped as creator of all, as God over all, as redeemer of those that he purchased with his own blood. What do we see in the power of Christ to create all things? We see our God. What do we see in the sovereignty of Christ over all of history? We see our God. What do we see in the humility of Christ? In his condescension and his love and compassion for sinners, we see our God. What do we see when the servant wraps a towel around his waist and washes the feet of his disciples? We see the heart of our God. What do we see when Jesus tenderly, compassionately helps those who are in need? We see our God. What do we see when Jesus forgives the vilest of sinners and calls them righteous? We see the heart of our God. What do we see when Jesus takes the scroll, breaks the seals, conquers the enemies, cleans up the earth, and reigns here? We will say, behold our God for whom we have waited. John the apostle and prophet was a visitor in this scene. He was an eyewitness out of place, out of body, out of time. But he was given a glimpse of a glorious future reality. 
And we this morning through John's pen are visitors to that same future scene. But one day, along with all who have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, John will not be falling down as a dead man in the presence of our glorified Christ. He, with all believers, will stand blameless with immeasurable joy in the presence of the one who redeemed his soul. Friend, will you be there? Blameless with great joy. Will you be in the company of the redeemed, purchased by the blood of Christ? Have you surrendered to the king? Surrender to the one who offered his life to give you all goodness? Or will you continue in your rejection of him and face judgment? Christian, what do we boast in? If we boast in anything, we boast in our Savior. We boast in Christ. We boast that we get to know God. What do you want more in a Messiah? What do you want more in a treasure? What do you want more in an ambition than to find yourself there around the throne praising him? Is he worthy? Is he worthy to receive all honor and glory and blessing? Let's sing together. He is worthy. Lord Jesus, thank you for being who you are. All that the angels have described all that the four living beings acknowledge, all that the 24 elders know. We believe by faith that one day we will see with our eyes these truths. You are worthy, O Lord to receive honor and glory and blessing and power and might. To yours is all authority and dominion and rule. The earth is yours. Heaven is yours. Your word says that you even condescend to the things in the highest heavens. You are above and beyond them all and yet you have made yourself known. You have made yourself near. You have made yourself accessible through the infinite cost of your own blood to bring us to such joys. We sing now as worship and as a preview of worship to come.